Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better, faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. I'm uh, thrilled to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Edward and this is where he's already given me a problem to solve, which is his surname. So, Dr. Edward Corlin, I'm going to say. Excellent. Brilliant. You nailed <laughs> uh, well, it. Welcome to the Talent Equation. Uh, thanks so much, George. Absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a big fan, so this is, a, this is a bucket list moment for me, to be perfectly honest. So, <laughs> so thanks for the invite. Well, um, in, in the spirit of mutual appreciation, I'm absolutely loving the content that you're putting out on, on Twitter. I think it's great. You're fighting the good fight. And also, I thought your podcast with Rob Gray was fantastic as well. So this is long overdue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we tried a couple of times a while back, but uh, it's great to finally get us get us connected. So Thanks, um, uh, <clears throat> I'd be great to maybe just get a little bit of your story, your backstory and kind of how you've ended up in in the space that you're in now and also sort of studying the stuff that you're studying now. Yeah, uh, look, it started off like any any kid in, in, in interested in sport. I played a load of sport when I was younger. Uh, loved it. I grew up in a very sporty family. And so the, the environment that I grew up in is the kind of environment I'm trying to recreate now. Um, it's the environments I see around the place are very ordered and very structured. And yet the environment I grew up in was one of just go out and play. Uh, did you enjoy it? Great. Most important thing. Pick up any racket, club, ball, and just give it a go. You know, I have vivid memories of breaking many windows in my house as a kid, and never getting scolded about it. You know, <laughs> just could you aim a bit more to the left, Ed? You know, this idea, <laughs> and just having that incredible support as a as a kid, just to go and play, go out and 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 see what you can come up with, invent a new game, let's say, you know. So so that was always going to be a part of my story. I feel I did go away from sport for a while, um, and and then and then again came back into it through a degree in sports science. But I was kind of always coaching. I was always still, even when I wasn't formally involved, I was always involved in coaching and and in, in interested in that space. Went and did my degree in sports science. And was immediately, uh, even when I was doing it, I was locked into this idea about skill acquisition. I was fascinated by it. Damien Farrell and and his colleagues had published a few papers previous to that that I found, and they just it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind. The stuff that they were doing down there still does to this day, in fact. And 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 that's really got me thinking that this is this is a space that actually actually you know, carve a little bit of a, an interest in, let's say. Uh, finished my degree, and as a result of my final year dissertation, I was looking at the impact of games versus drills on the the frequency of use of kids using their non-dominant sighted skills. So mm-hmm. could I improve the, 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 how often they use their non-dominant sighted skill by either games or drills? And the results were nuts. The games just had a hugely more impactful uh, response with the kids. And uh, well, kids, they were development squads of under 14s. And as a result of that, I uh, I kind of got in touch with uh, Mark Williams in in Liverpool, and I was like, "This is kind of what I'm interested. In. Uh, I like the stuff you do. Is this something you're interested in?" And typical Mark, Mark is Mr. Yes. He says yes to everything. Yes, come over and have a chat. And I was like, "Well, that was that was easy." <laughs> went over and had a chat and it was literally by the end he said let's do it why not and let's we'll figure all the other stuff out as we go so he had just he had an incredibly open response to say well why not let's not think of why we shouldn't do it let's just think of why of course we should do it you know yeah so that brought me to liverpool for a number of years where 
loads of things changed. We went to Liverpool with no kids. We came out of Liverpool with two kids, and obviously, so we now have scousers in the house for the rest of our lives. So, so <laughs> it's 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 great. It's great. We've these two little fellas running around the house with little moustaches, and it's it's fantastic, and um, shiny tracksuits. Um, but so that was a fantastic period because while I was there with Mark. Mark's MO as a supervisor is to expose you to as many different spaces, even around your particular field of study, but he's going to expose you to all other facets of it. So in my time there, between work I was doing personally with, within my own work and the way he had all the postgrads linked up, I found myself getting into some incredible stuff. You know, we were working with Scottish curling we were doing eye movement stuff with them. We were doing stuff with British shooting. And again, some of that might have been me just helping out one of the other postgrads. But you're getting into some heavy duty data collection and information about the quiet eye. We started doing a lot of stuff around rugby with, with places, doing performance analysis stuff. He, because of his reach, he just wants to expose his students to, to that. And... We, I started finding myself, I was doing match analysis for, uh, and reports for UEFA and all that because of his, his links with their, their science unit and stuff. So by the end of my PhD, I was just so fully into the, the idea of, OK, I want to now try and impact on all of that, but still bring it back to creating good environments for practice. And I, I, I probably need to take a step back because there was one seminal, really seminal moment while I was doing my degree that Rick Shuttleworth arrived in my university for a year. And I had already been in this space of, wow, this is amazing stuff. And all of a sudden, Rick lands in, in, in front of me. And I was like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> it, was this, it was this kind of uh, romance. And, and it was probably very one-sided because I was just a student in, but I was like, this guy, the stuff he did with us, like he arrived in Ireland, he would never have seen our national sports, let's say, right? And yeah. yet, within one session, he was creating environments for us to have to problem solve with a sport he had never seen before because he just understood about movement, understood about constraints. And he also freed us up by saying, lads, just fail. Give it a go. I have no problem if you fail. And even I, I, I recall him saying at one point, if you're doing your assessment and you're trying something and it, and it goes terribly wrong, you're not going to fail because you tried it. I would prefer that. So, so all of these people were feeding my idea of, of what I grew up with, you know, that space and that environment. Just go out and have fun. Try things. Don't be looking for order. Look for disorder, you know. Try it. Actually, actually it only, it, it's only really fun when you can break it. And let's see how quickly you can break it, you know. So, <laughs> so then, as I said, I came, uh, I came back to Ireland after my PhD with all these kind of ideas, but with also some great connections from my time there. And... And I suppose that's that's kind of where I'm at since. I've been very fortunate because of my time with Mark that now I work across sports. I'm really, really fortunate that I'm working with uh, uh, in, in golf at the moment. I'm working in pentathlon at the moment. I'm working in hurling and football and rugby. And, and you know what I mean? I'm able to dip in and dip out because I'm what I do in skill acquisition isn't confined to one sport. So... I'm I'm back being a teenager where I was playing all these different sports, but now I'm just very now very focused on that practice space. I I make my I I I, I suppose my my career as an academic is with is in Cork Institute of Technology, but for when I when I'm not lecturing, I'm engaging with athletes to try and make their their environment and the practice space that they do incredibly similar and with a high, high fidelity to what they experience in competition. That's where I get my kicks. Can I have athletes have those eureka moments of, oh my God, this feels exactly like it does in competition. You if we can might. get to those space, if I, if I can get to those little moments, then we're in the sweet spot. And that's where, that's where I think all of practice should be. In fact, all practice should be in that sweet spot. You may have, um, you may have, you may have, uh, you may maybe the marketing guy in me, but um, I think you might have just coined a new phrase: "Hi-fi coaching." <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe high fidelity coaching. I love it. I love it. Be no, careful um, that be careful that Apple don't take it and they'll make it into something crazy or well, something. Well, we heard like, it here I, first. We've got the copyright yes, already. Yes, I love it. <laughs> so, um, um, fantastic. Thank you for. I mean, it's a fantastic story. I'm glad to hear, by the way, that um, uh, meeting Rick 
uh, I, I'm not the only person who had the same experience, that same kind of fanboy bromance experience yeah. with Rick. <laughs> and I still have it. And that's, the, that's the great thing. Like, he's, I met him in Finland there before Christmas. We were at that event out in, in, in Kisikalia that Keith Davids uh, uh, helps organise. And oh my God, what an event that was. It was just, it was as, as the, the organiser got up and he announced, he said, we've got the Rolling Stones followed by the Beatles, you know, <laughs> and that was Keith David's followed by Carl Newell. You're like, oh, my God. And then rocks up Damien Farr. You're like, oh, my God, hang on. Am I, 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 this is strange here. You know, is this, is this some kind of a strange, strange uh, other existence I've after walking into, you know, an incredible event, be, more so, you know, because of the interaction around the talks, you know, yeah. fantastic speakers, great way, way to deliver what they do. But everybody there was just open to interrogate the content. Mm. There was this openness to fire questions. Keith David's hanging around, just being, being accessible to people. Damien Farrow being open to ask questions from anybody in the room, let's say, like, you know, and and that's what you want. You want people who are not protective about what they know, you know, who who aren't trying to pretend that they've reinvented the wheel. And, and I, I and I'm the only person with the key to, to, to the secret of it, you know, um, and that's why. You know, that's why we're trying to do what we're doing now in Cork in, in April with, with Ali Logan and Phil Carney and Alan Dunton and myself. We're just, we're going to, we're going to see if we can bring that type of a, a space where, where it, it, it's a forum, you know, it's, it's an interactive forum where we're going to get speakers to come and talk to us about their journey and what their experience is and how they've learned through failing and not be afraid of failing. And then we're going to get people an opportunity to just fire stuff at them, you know, mm. we're not going to speaker to speaker to speaker to speaker. We're going to say, okay, we have a speaker, only two this evening, because we're going to spend a lot of time talking this stuff out. We're, we have access to the hall here to figure stuff out if it comes up and you know what I mean? Yeah. So we, because we want people to go away and, and say, I'm going to try that on Monday, you know, yeah. and I'm going to, and I've got some world-class people who are telling me they failed 50 times when they first tried it. So you know what? If I fail 50 times, great, but they did and look where they got to it, you yeah. know. So we want to just, I suppose, normalize the idea of 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 failure, you know, and, and that people know that you should be <laughs> you should be sitting uncomfortably and your pants should feel a little bit. Oh, did I just let something go there? Because <laughs> this is, you know, I don't know, is this working and this this game I've set up? I don't know. Is it working? But I think they're trying to figure it out because if they're trying to figure it out, I think I'm actually in a good space. If we're if we've just created an environment for people in a realistic space to problem solve and make really meaningful decisions, well then I, then I, then we're in a good place. If it begins if it becomes twee at any point, if it becomes ordered and automatic, change it quickly <laughs> because that's not what's going to happen in the game. And I think that's that's what's so fun at the moment. I think there's we're 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 getting to really great critical mass right now with that with the amount of people out there uh, around the place. And there's there's another guy we're we're actually linking with an event in Minneapolis on the same two days with Sean Mishka, the the movement Miyagi as as he's known. Yeah. Um, Sean's and a friend of the yeah, show. Yeah, like you you know like talking yeah. to him and, and and a colleague of his that he he links up with Ross Cooper. These guys, they're constantly in that space of. I'm just going to try and mess it up because mm -hmm. when we talk with the athletes in game after a game, they tell us it feels pretty messed up. It feels alive. It feels uncontrolled. It feels I have to, it feels responsive and reactive. So let's give them all of those stimuli when we're in practice as well. I don't know and about you, I don't know about you, but I've been watching um, the Vikings with real interest. Yeah. Watching exactly. that defensive unit and, and, you know, having spoken to Sean and hearing what he does and obviously like that. And, and of course, you know, I'm looking at it with a particular lens and I, I appreciate that. But it really is interesting to see a group of athletes who, you know, nearly got to the Super Bowl, um, who are you can just sort of see it in front of your eyes that they are playing that game in a different way. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's changed. I, I said it to him, actually. He's changed my appreciation for for the NFL. I've always been a fan. I'll be up all Sunday night watching the, the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. But I'm watching it with a different lens now. I'm very much so. I'm, I have a greater appreciation for what they do. Mm. I, I, I'd be the first to admit, previously, I was quite cynical. Um, uh, 
the all type athletes we you've got your you you've got your linemen and all they've got to do is move that other 300 pound guy in front of them and you've got this guy he's going to run that route every single time and and then all of a sudden they started realizing hang on that that's the world class guys aren't doing that at all the world class quarterbacks when they're world class wide receivers and all that they're playing a different game to everyone else yeah. Yet, when you go and look at some of the coaching that they'll experience, you see that they're being, they're being coached in a very didactic way, you know, mm. which is the same in every sport. They're no different there, you know. Mm. But then, but those, those, those players who experience a different approach from their coaches at a younger age and even as an, at an adult age, they are the ones that, that, that emerge from the pack, you know. They're, that's what, some of the things you see that Bill Belichick does. The simulation in his training sessions is incredible. Mm. They go to the point where even players who, who who may not be impacted on the next play, they're still going to line up. Why? Because you know what? You need to see what this looks like. And they go to that that level of detail. And people always say, oh, well, they have the, the time and the money and the resources. And you're like, well, they do. But you have the same number of players. <laughs> you have all your players are training with you. So... Why don't you just play it, simulate it, set up a scenario, set up a situation? Do they figure it out? Is it too far ahead for them? If it is, bring it back. If it's not, push again. So I, I'm always slow to accept the idea, you know, the always slow, in fact, to accept the resources as a, a reason why some teams are better than others. And we have it in Ireland at the moment, in fact. The current, the current All-Ireland champions in our national sport of Gaelic football will be D Dublin, okay? And the criticism that people put out there, they've just won a three in a row, okay? Incredibly dominant team. But they're a dominant team for all the right reasons. They're playing what's in front of them. They've been coached in a way that allows freedom and expression of how to play themselves. Yes, do they have a game plan? Of course. But they also aren't rigid to the game plan because something they, they know there's an opposition out there who's going to try and stop them, you know? Yeah. And as a result of that, they always appear to have another gear. They always appear to be able to respond to some adversity on the field, you know, and there's a, there, there's, there's a sense of calm. Now, it also comes from their, their manager is a very calm individual on the line because he's like, hey, you're out there playing. I can't do anything now at this stage. But there's also that calm with them. They, they appear to have that sense of, well, the calmer I am, the more freer my head's going to be to be able to respond to what's happening in front of me. And people will go on about, well, it's the capital. They have the more money than everything else. It's not. It's good coaching. It's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. You, yeah. you almost kind of say, sorry, you're actually, you're looking for excuses. It's just good coaching. It's fascinating to me, actually, um, how, how little people will, how little emphasis people will place on coaching. It's almost as if, I think, and a lot of this is to do with the fact that I think there's this huge, um, uh, lack of appreciation of the skill in coaching partly due to the fact for for the public perception of what coaching is so for example taking let's take nfl as we've just been talking about you know um <clears throat> the assumption is that you know coaching is uh, the guy who comes up with all the plays directs all the activity is quite didactic in the approach and all those sorts of things what's interesting in nfl is is that like for example with the vikings you know they outsource the skill acquisition you know, go to a skill acquisition specialist to get skillful. We're just going to create these plays and you've got to be able to run them. It's kind of weird. <laughs> yes. then it's happening elsewhere as well, though. I know lots of lots of sports where you've got these sort of skill acquisition specialists coming in to sort of do the skills bit. And I'm thinking yes. to myself, well, if coaching isn't about skill acquisition, what is it about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it's an interesting so dynamic true. that's taking place. But it comes back to this misperception of what, what co the skill of what is involved in coaching. And Absolutely. therefore, that becomes really pervasive because the more people who come into coaching, assuming it's one thing, and then after about 10 years of not getting on very well, finding out it's something else. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It is. And, and, and you've just hit on a really a salient point that I took away from that Dave Passmore conference a, a couple of weeks ago. On the Friday evening, he had Jason Sherlock, a legend in Irish sport. He's, he, he's what we would call a triple threat. He's played at the highest level in Irish sport in three sports. Mm. It's incredible. Mm. Soccer. In the in our national league at a, at, a, at a at a top club, basketball he played for Ireland and also in the Super League and in Gaelic football he played senior in county football for for Dublin, across three three sports. Now yes, three team sports and so on and so forth, but that's an incredible track record 
the amount of games he would have played. He was a point guard in basketball and so on and so forth. A, a, a fantastic way about him as well and how he speaks. And it's very, just a very humble guy, but also very, again, open to discussion. And one line he said that absolutely, I nearly broke my pen as I was trying to write it down so quickly. He said, of all the years I, as a player, I, 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 when I started coaching, I realized that none of my playing had any impact on how to coach. <laughs> and here's a guy who has lived sport all his life and played at the highest level. But he said he, he, it, it, it was at, at that moment that he realized, well, my playing has actually no impact on my ability to coach. But we don't see or hear or appreciate that often enough. Yeah. And hence we have, you know, former top players being accelerated through coaching programs to get them to coaching as opposed to respecting that it's a different skill set. Yeah. You know, respecting that there's, and here you have, here you have an incredibly astute guy who's now retired from sport, who's now in that coaching space, who's saying, actually, it's a different skill set. My plane didn't really help me because that's a different, I'm, I'm asking different questions. I'm posing different problems. And then the following day, we had a guy, Graham Shaw, who's now the head coach of the Irish women's hockey team, right? Another, like, another very impressive guy. 159 caps for Ireland as a player, senior international. Yeah. And here he is talking about, yeah, when I started coaching, I just used to kind of coach the way I was coached. And then I realized, well, that doesn't cut it. <laughs> and the journey he's gone through to now become a really important coach in the women's game in Ireland and in, and in hockey in Ireland because there's that appreciation that playing and coaching are two distinct skill sets because they're two through very different lenses and we need to be better respecting and appreciating that difference you know it's it's really interesting isn't it because um i I, we, well, we see it all the time, don't we? There's been some pretty high-profile appointments made in English football that have caused some interesting, uh, interesting responses. <laughs> and there is an assumption that because you have knowledge, technical knowledge, or or experience um, of uh, tactical experience of, of all that sort of stuff, that you have an ability to convey that or to somehow allow other individuals to be able to em embrace that. And it's, I think it's purely based on the idea. But if you tell somebody something and you give them the knowledge, that's enough. Yes. The knowledge transfers yes. into the the action, you know, and we, yes. we know that there's a huge gap between knowledge and knowing and doing. Yes. And 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 this is one of the reasons, as you were talking then, I was talking today with somebody who described coaching as an art. And mm -hmm. I said, I don't, know, I, I don't think it's an art, I, nor do I think it's a science. Mm -hmm. I think it's something in between. And I, so I call it a craft. Yeah, because if you think of a craftsperson or a craftsman, they have to go through years of apprenticeship and then they yeah. have to and then and they make it their own. So they get their own. They find their own way. But it's based on a grounding of solid, uh, you know, understanding of the use of the tools and all these sorts of things. Now, when you think of coaching as a craft, well, you can't shortcut that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a key thing. I, I again, talking with. I had a, a, a chat with, with Peter Arnott earlier on, and he's like, there's a guy that is right in that sweet spot of just that challenging space of trying to figure it out. Can I do good by my the athletes I'm working with to make sure that every time they're practicing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to transfer into that competition space? And, that, and, what we're, and what we're talking about, the difference between what is coaching and how to coach. And I was saying to him, I said, this morning, I, said, I, had my, I asked my students, I said, what's, what's an appendectomy? And they were like, uh, it's, a, it's a surgery to remove, to remove uh, your appendix. Right. So we know what it is. How do you do it? <laughs> I said, so, so you all know what it is. So surely if you know what it is, you should all be able to conduct an appendectomy right now. Anyone have any pa pain in their side? And they're like, that's just crazy. And I said, but that's the essence of it. In the same way right now, the IRFU here through Nick Winkleman and Matt Wilkie are actually looking at how how to coach it's a fantastic they're actually they're engaging in the process of seeing of, of seeing the difference between what coaching is and how to coach because there is a, a distinct difference and when you when you when you're aware of that difference well then you're going to start asking different questions you're going to start actually looking at it in a way not to put something out there 
and have it as my session, but you're actually going to start looking at out there and think, thinking, well, how am I going to figure this session out tonight? How am I going to create a space for them to actually feel like they learned tonight? They that that they had a penny drop for them, let's say, you know, because it's very different. We don't we don't again we, we go back to that. We don't respect the difference between number one difference between playing and coaching, but also now we don't respect the difference enough of what coaching is and how to coach. Mm-hmm. You can go to do a coaching course and no matter what level it is, ask what a coach is, you'll get chapter and verse about what it is to coach. How to coach is something that you've got to step off the cliff and <laughs> cock it up a load of times to really figure it out, let's say, you know, and that's where the concern sometimes when you see former players being accelerated into a program is that it's so unfortunate for them because they, they're, they're cocking up at the cold face, mm. they're cocking up when they're at an inter- at a national squad or at a first team place, and that's just not fair because there's probably great potential for them one day to become a great coach, but they're going to get scared off it if that's the place that they're going to have to figure that out. Let's say you know. And that's not to say that um, when you're in the elite context that you're not going to make mistakes. It's just that your mistakes are either smaller or they have a less of a magnitude or yeah. they are. You know, you're, you're you're more easily able to recognize when things are maybe not quite where you want them to be. And you can make micro adjustments much more rapidly. Absolutely. Um, but it goes back to where you started with around talking about failure. You know, the inherent nature of what we do is is littered with small errors mm. or, or littered with error. And when you start out as a novice, those errors are quite magnified. And actually, yes. you know, you have to experience some of those to then think, hmm, probably won't do that again. <laughs> And then yeah. as you get towards, you know, the more elite <laughs> end, you're still doing it because otherwise you're not learning. I mean, every experience has to be a learning experience. But like I said earlier, you know, you're, you're, you're more adaptable, you're more flexible. You can go with the flow a little bit more. And that's where yeah. the expertise comes in. Absolutely. And that's where that's where I absolutely love my my the work I do with athletes, because then you're right there with the athlete trying to say, OK, yes, you might have some stats about where your play is at the moment. Great. That might give you a little bit of information about you know, if you're a golfer, where your game needs to improve this, that or the other. But there's still a lot of context that we do not get from the stats, let's say. So let's 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 drill down into the context today. Drill is probably a bad word based on <laughs> my, my philosophy, but you get what I mean. Let's mine. Let's mine that space. Let's mine that space a bit more. But if you ha- if we're in that place where, where, where we're with the athlete and we're constantly asking them, are we in the sweet spot here? Do you feel pressure now? Do you feel that if you miss this kick or miss this put or miss this serve, that there's a there's a actually a meaningful consequence behind it? Well, not really. Well, then let's stop doing it. Because in a game and in a competition and on the course or whatever, you definitely feel that as a consequence. Yeah, of course, because I'm well, well, let's do something here. Let's try and replicate that so that the, the greater simulation and replication of what we do here, the greater likelihood that that's going to transfer. And the fun stuff in that for me is the many, many times you mess it up with the athlete. Mm -hmm. If you put it out there with the athlete, we're not going to crack this in an hour, you know, (laughs) but we're going to crack this because we're going to be in it together. We're right now, since as soon as we started working, we're a team and we're going to figure this out together. And you're, I'm going to throw stuff at you and go like, Ed, that is diabolical. No, that doesn't, you know. Oh, a little bit more there. Okay, let's push there. Well, how does that feel? Well, what if I do this? Great. What if I, you do that? Great. And it's in that process that all of a sudden you will have those moments of that feels like pressure right there. Mm-hmm. Because maybe we've built up the context sufficiently. We've identified that balance between it needing that quality and, of course, quantity, of course. Mm-hmm. We've also made sure that it's relevant to where you need to. Because the easy thing is to work on all the things you're good at. Let's make it relevant to your overall performance improvement. And then let's identify a consequence that actually matters to you. If we can get all those things in that little bowl right there in front of you, you're going you're gonna to eat that all day, all day long. And I think it, that's, that's that fun stuff. But that fun stuff only comes when you're prepared to fail and fail and fail and, and all of a sudden realize, we're there. We're in that sweet spot. And we're now in a really intense space. You could lose f- the next four hours mm. without a word being spoken. Mm. Because you spent time trying to get to it. Yeah. 
from my experience, how let's say how I would have been coached or how I coached in the early days, like, oh my gosh, you know, I look back and some of the coaching I did mm. and I, I kind of feel like I got to pen some letters to people and say, look, I'm really <laughs> sorry. You know, that padded room you're in, that's because of me, man. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I messed you up back then, you know. <laughs> I was telling you it was all about numbers and get as many of them done and don't leave, don't leave the range till you've hit 50 in a row and that, <laughs> I did. I did all. I did all of those <laughs> horrendous. Like I say, if the UN heard about some of the crimes to humanity I was doing, I'd be, I'd be in a serious place. Like you know, it's, it. And, but there was that moment of thinking. There's an inconsistency to the work I'm doing, yeah. and I absolutely had that. I felt, I felt. I, I, I don't know when this is working and when it's not. You'd have a great run with the team or an individual. But I wouldn't know how. I wouldn't know why. And then you try to do the same thing with someone else, and it would be an absolute disaster. And in typical coach thing, I blame the athlete when that happens. <laughs> because it, my, my stuff works. Yeah. It worked with the other person. So if it's not working with you, you're the problem. <laughs> I, and uh, that was that, was I, that uh, moment. That was those moments. I had a few of those moments where I was thinking, actually, Ed, it's you. <laughs> You're the problem. Uh, they're horrible, those moments, aren't they? The, that's when all the kind of blood pours out of your face and you just get that pit of the stomach feeling. Oh, God, it's me. Well, um, yeah. I think one of, the one of the things I sometimes think about with this podcast is, is that sometimes I think it's kind of a way of me exercising my previous coaching demons, you know, and I, yeah. and, and I think you've probably just – so you've now had your – uh, coaching confessional live on the podcast, you know, so yeah. that's your public apology to everybody exactly. you once coached. Exactly, exactly. Letters on a letters on a postage stamp too, please. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, I, do you know that's a good moment? It's a good moment. I mean, I, I really want to do, you know, because when I've got somebody with your kind of research background on the podcast, I'm I'm kind of really keen to sort of touch on some of the research, which we will, I think we'd like to get back yeah. to at some at some stage, but you just sort of piqued my interest with something where you talked about the use of consequences. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things I hope I, I try and do with the podcast is try and, you know, try and get as practical as possible, because I think yeah. quite a lot of people who are, are tuning in, you know, aren't necessarily always completely, uh, you know, into the research side. So, of course. Um, I, I I love using consequences as well. I think I want to create, if I'm going to create some realism, as you say, you know, high fidelity to what they experience in the competition environment. So we're doing hi-fi coaching now. Yeah. And I want to try and create realism or I want to try and at the very least create some form of as close as possible simulation to the sort of pressure they're going to have yeah. in, the, in the competition environment. Obviously, uh, depending on what kind of activity I'm doing. If it's something that's more exploratory, we might not throw consequence in. But when we're starting to get towards that performance space and we're looking yeah. like we're going to perform, then consequences. So can you give me a flavour of the sort of things you do with the, with the players or, or just some things yeah. you have done in the past and things that have worked or not? Yeah, um, I think the first thing I would say about consequences and, and, and again, figuring them out for the player and for the individual is that they have to be personally invested in them. So the so I was asked there recently, uh, Ed, do you have a system for coming up with consequences? And I said, no, because systems make me break out in a rash. Systems <laughs> systems suggest that there's a linear relationship. You do this and this will happen. So, no, I don't have a system. And in fact, in the other way around, I say, yes, I have a system, but it's a different system every time with every athlete, you know, <laughs> because because I can't say because it is all exploration. So. So, so in that regard, it is very personal. It, it's a very personal thing. You could have a money, you could have a money consequence for one person, and the next person has no, absolutely no interest in that, and it makes it has no impact on them. So you have to, again, you spend a little time with the the person to find out well what are the things that kind of irk them, what are the things that freak them out, and so on and so on and so on. And I'll give you one example. There's a there's a, a phenomenal coach here in Ireland called James Weldon, and he's a basketball coach. And this guy is your quintessential growth mindset coach, right? He, this guy chews up stuff, and he will try it. He will try it the very next night with his team, and he's got he had huge success over the years. But he'll try it. He's he's prepared to expose himself. You know, on the court with the players, be like, oh, my God. Yeah, sorry, lads. I'm just trying something there. You know, that kind of way. Brilliant. Okay. So we've been working with each other for, for a good few years. And 
great philosophy about him, player centered and everything. And he asked me one night, he said, would I come down and have a look at one, uh, a basketball team he's working with? And I said, I will. And he said, look, you know, we're going to we'll just, you know, jump in whenever you want. And, uh, you know, I let them know who you are so they don't think who's your man and all this. And I said, great. So I was down there watching. He, he was running a few plays with them and he had a 5v5 on the court. And I was like, I said, okay, let's see. You know, there wasn't much happening. If they, if they failed to execute a point, a score, we just reset, we go again. And I was like, the relevance here may be relevant, maybe something relevant to the game, but the consequence, there's, there's no intensity. So I stopped and I said, okay, guys, what, you know, what's, I think I recognize the play that you're doing there and so on and so forth. I know, you know, what, are, what, what's going on. I said, but there's no consequence. So what, what happens when you don't, you don't score? And we, we go again. We got to get four in a row. We got to get five in a row. You're like, yeah, we could be here all night, guys, if you don't, you know what I mean? Because they're going to try and stop you. And I was like, so what, what, what if, if every time you don't score, one of the guys in the other team can nominate one of you that they get your phone open for a minute. <laughs> open access. <laughs> no way, man. No way. That's man, That's crazy. No, 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 no. And as soon as I got that response, I knew that was we were in. If I got no response, I wouldn't have gone with it. They're like, oh, yeah, all right. Whereas people's phone nowadays, the people in their 20s and stuff, like people who have my phone all day, they wouldn't find nothing on it, guys. But for the younger generation, their phone is everything. All of a sudden, someone could get into their WhatsApp and send, you know, this kind of thing. We had it in that moment. We're like, no, run the play. The intensity went through the roof immediately because now it was something. First of all, the defensive team, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark you. I'm, it's you I'm getting. Yeah. I'm going to choose as you, you know. His intensity and all that. Now you could go into another group. You could go into another twelves group of that, where no one has a phone and won't make any difference. Yeah. So that's that. That's an example. Let's say. Yeah. Now brilliant. it goes and it has to be now. As soon as you could do that a couple of times, you could do that a couple of plays, and all of a sudden it runs itself out because then they just start doing silly things, and everyone then realizes. Ah, sure, everyone knows. Sure, you have my phone, and I don't. You know, I didn't say that. I, you know, what whatever silly things they'll do on their phone, right? So then you've got to be able to change it again and identify those consequences so and it can be anything it can be okay guys well look you know the uh the losing team will be dropped after training after practice a mile from here you got to walk back and get your own cars <laughs> you know immediately that brings an edge an edge to it because then without without there being a packed stadium without where that they are now experiencing a psychosomatic response where there is an increase in heart rate, an increase in breathing rate, an increase in focus and intensity. And now they're, they're going to try and absolutely execute when they go on a 3-2 formation up into the whatever. I, I, what I love about that is um, whenever you talk about consequences, you know, I, I describe it as the C word. Um, <laughs> It's like it's a it's like it's a taboo, um, and people think, oh, it's about punishment. Oh, punishment, that's bad. Punish, punishment is bad, and they always assume it's like running laps or whatever. Yeah. Do you know what? Never run. Do you know, my players, they they honestly they don't really care about that. It's not that yeah. big of a deal for them. The one for me, I was coaching a girls' team, and um, uh, I say a girls' team it was a women's team, and we were playing a thing, and I said, right, so what, what's the what what are we going to come up with to kind of you know raise the level? What's going to take us to the edge? And they came the, the thing they came up with that gave them the most fear. They had to sing a song to the the winning the winning team had to had to listen the losing team had to sing a song to the others, and we filmed it and we put it on Facebook. I tell you what, it, like you say, intensity went through yeah. the roof. Yeah, you can and, be and creative, they're... and they'll come up with some amazing stuff. There and, I, and so that's a key thing for me with the consequence. There can be no trap door. And what I mean by that is you can't have a consequence. And, and again, I, I figured this along the way. You said, oh, look, if you don't do this, you've got to give 100 euros to this charity. Well, actually, the trap door here is, well, you know, if I lose, at least the charity's getting some money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I've lost them, you yeah. know. Oh, you, you've, got to, you've got to run a lap. Actually, my fitness is going to improve if I do that. Do you know what I mean? You made me think. You made me think about something there, because um, obviously we as humans are motivated by either the acquisition of, of pleasure or the avoidance mm. of pain. So yeah. the best one about motivation I ever heard was uh, there's a famous story I think about a lady who was desperate to quit smoking, couldn't couldn't kick the habit. You know, she's forty a day girl, this that and the other. And you know what got her there? She wrote a contract with a friend, and she was like a she was a big civil rights activist. And she said she wrote a contract with a friend and said, 
if I take another cigarette ever in my life, I give ten thousand dollars to the Ku Klux Klan. Holy smokes! <laughs> Talk about burning wow. your boats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's it. No trapdoor. So th- no, no trapdoor. Yeah. So that's the same. There's a similar story of a guy in the states who, again, around consequences, working with his athlete, and same. You've got to donate to the Republican Party. He was like, <laughs> no, and he, and he was like, okay, fine. He said, no, no, no. But you've got to publicly make it known, you know, because <laughs> you could donate and no one would know about it. You've got to put it out there that I'm actually donating to the huge. It huge. intensifies what it is. So it's not about. And again, this is not about punishment. I absolutely. And you were saying that some people think that yeah. it's not about punishment. When you can see that glint in an athlete's eye that they're locked in, they are absolutely in the moment because they are now experiencing that. Everything matters in that moment mm. because when they're in the game, they'll tell you it all matters. Mm. When a guy is on a tee box or he's serving, or he's serving in a tennis court or whatever, that shot, that stroke is the most important thing in his world right there and then. Mm. Now, you'd hope that they're a balanced individual that when the game is over, they can move on. But in game time, in competition time, it is the most important thing that they've got going on. If you can have that intensity to have that laser focus where that consequence is and again that's something i spoke with peter arnold about earlier on i've introduced this idea also over the last couple of years of always a get out clause because you're always going to get another opportunity so i'll always give them an opportunity oh you failed at that great that's the consequence later on but you're always going to get a chance to get it back because you know what there's always another game there's always another round there's always another match yeah. And we need the, we need the athletes to to have that feeling of, well, yes, right now it's the most important thing in the world all right now, and then when it's over, well, I'm gonna get another chance. I'm like gonna getting, be able to try again. Yeah, it's like getting a life in a video game. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah, exactly yeah. like that. And and I think and I think also when 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 people then have that feeling, and it's a balancing act, when they they commit fully to that moment, great. If they fail, they know there's a consequence. But then in that also moment of the consequence, they know I'm going to have a chance later on because that's what we want in our athletes. We want balanced athletes to be able to win and enjoy that, but not get too high about it, not get too low when they lose, because you know what? I'm going to have another chance. And we'll see. We see that all over the place, even at the very end of a championship. I'll be back next year. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, so I, I we, we what, have you know, to give that opportunity. Yeah, well, you know, the. Um the whole acquisition of pleasure thing as well. I think my, particularly my little ones, my Sunday morning, uh, little ones that under 10s, one of the things they love the most talk about consequences is, is for me to have to perform the consequence. Nothing (laughs) motivates them more. And I I posted it on Twitter or I didn't, one of the parents did, thankfully. They did this deal. They were playing in a competition. I said, you know, you guys, are you trying your absolute best? Are you working your hardest? And oh, probably not. I said, okay, are you going to work your hardest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so if you guys work your hardest and you pass to each other and all that sort of stuff, we might, we might get a better result in the game. Yeah, okay, okay. Right. So if we do it and all the parents agree that you worked your hardest, right, then I am going to sing the jelly song (laughs) which was this random song that i just completely made up and then they go and i said but if if all the parents say you didn't work your hardest then you have to do the jelly song tell you what this this was like a kids possessed they were like just going for it it was just fascinating to watch it is it is and that's and that's what's so that's so what's so great about the kind of work that we talk about and all the work, all the great work that so many coaches are doing is that it brings you back to that mm. childhood space, that backyard games. Mm. I remember having games in the back garden that was bigger than the World Cup final. It mm. mattered. Yeah. It seriously mattered. I'm in the, in the, in the house, not speaking to anyone for the rest of the evening. Why? I lost a penalty shootout 4 3 to in the garden, in between two trees and a, you know, and a bottle and a jersey down the other end. Because it mattered. That's when we got better. That's how we learned how to cope with failure and success. And it really mattered. Because when you're a kid, you put huge context on everything. You, okay, where are we? We're in Wembley with 80,000. No, where are we? We're in Augusta and Eamon Corner. No, where are we? We're in Wimbledon. And we're only out in the road and there's cars passing. We're in Wimbledon. There's 15,000. <laughs> yeah. 
we build all of that very innately as kids. And then we just think it's not cool to do it as adults. Yeah. yeah. When you know what? It's it's very cool because you're simulating. Yeah. We're back into our hi fi hi fi coaching. Because yeah. currently what I see quite a bit is is inheritance coaching. I'm coaching the way I, I was coached. Yeah. And you're like, oh no. So if I'm coaching the way if I coach the way I was coached and the 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 person before me coached me the way they were coached, all of a sudden I'm coaching this person in something that was 30, 40 years old. The other side of that is transplant coaching. No, I see them doing it. So I'm just going to take that and put it in here without any context, without any understanding of why they were doing it and so on and so forth, you know? Yeah. And again, it's not that we can't, it's not that we can't be critical at certain times or whatever else, but we've got to be able to ask those questions. We've got to be able to interrogate into, into the why and so and and and, and fig, figure that out. We we changed a module this year. There's one of my colleagues and I, uh, uh, Con Burns here in, in CIT. We we co-teach in a lot of our coaching mo- coaching science module, and we changed up one of the modules this year to have the entire module through constraints. Essentially, we're going to work with the students, introduce concepts, and then let them go, mm-hmm. let them explore. And I remember after about week six, I, I went into Con's office and I was like. This is not working, man. I I said, I think I'm after making a major balls up here. And he said, why? He said, they're just, they're not getting it at all. And I I, I, I would have thought they would have by now. And, and in fairness to me, he's like, he says, yeah, but I, you're the one who always says this takes time. Mm. Well, a week later, I went up to the sports hall. We did the thing and I floated back to the office <laughs> and I was doing it like, they got it. But it was that. I, I even hadn't for, forgotten myself that it takes time for these things to emerge. We changed all our assessment around it. We didn't have any of this lesson plan and, and, uh, and then your timings and ma- how are your timings in your session? How are your timings in your session? Well, if you've got to work on something, well, you keep working on that. If mm. you think it's important, if it's relevant to them, if there's a good context behind it, stay working on it. So we changed everything. We didn't. We got rid of lesson plans. We 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 exposed them to a new sport each week, kind of thing. To say, okay, well, you got to do it now in football, or it's got to be in badminton, or whatever. And then we just asked them to reflect on it. That's how that was their lesson plan. But it was after the fact. What did you do? How did you think it would have gone? How did it go? How would you change it to do it again? What did you learn yourself? What did you learn from one of the athletes? And it changed the entire module. And all of a sudden, it wasn't about us. We're going to tell you how to do this because we know it all. It was actually, you know what? We're figuring this out ourselves. Even though we're the lecturers and you're the students, let's take away that. Let's let's see if we can all learn from this. Yeah, yeah. Feedback from the students was that was great. I, I felt I had so much more control over what I was doing, and I was given this freedom to just think outside the box. And sure, that's that's what we want. Yeah. But it but even in that, and every week you're doing them for two three hours a week. It still took them six weeks. It still, it still challenged me to think, geez, they're not getting it. But they were, but just slowly, because they have five or other modules that they've got to do in other subjects and whatever, you know? This is one of the things that I think, um, I think is one of the hardest things for people to grasp. I mean, and you, you yourself have just said there that you struggled to grasp it. And I think um, part of it's linked to edu- education and coach education, where the one of the uh, ways we would assess the success of a session would mm-hmm. be whether we saw a performance improvement within that session. And mm-hmm. so therefore, when that's an assessment criteria, you kind of you're hardwiring that in. But at the same time, it's also driven from the fact that I think also from a kind of ego perspective, you know, it makes us as coaches feel better when <laughs> we see performance improvement in head in front of our eyes, because that's what we're there. But I think for me, that's like that's one of the the biggest sort of um almost like um, illusions that we need to Mm -hmm. overcome because uh, funnily enough, I was working with a coach doing doing quite a bit of coach development work at the moment. And I was down doing an observation um, uh, the other night and the coach I was working with, uh, the session did not go as he wanted it to go. Right. Right. I could tell. Um, Yeah. Wasn't bad. It was not a bad session. And I reckon the, the players probably thought it was okay. Yeah. I could tell it was not going right for him. It was not what he was not getting what he intended from his yeah. activity. So what he would do is he would either bring them in 
have a conversation about what was happening or he would um, he would uh, he would change the activity or whatever it was or he abandoned it at one point and did something else. And I was thinking to myself, the, stru- the 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 value is in the struggle. As Dave Allred mm. said that to me once. You know, he said mm. the learning is in the struggle. The learning is in the ugly zone, mm. and they're in the ugly zone. They're, yeah. they're right where you want them to be, and yes. you kind of want them to be able to come out of that ugly zone kind of instantaneously and get all this within around about yeah. five to ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let it go. It might take yes. three weeks. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And that's that critical thing between a practice effect and a performance effect. The literature in motor learning will tell us a practice effect is something that's an acute change in behavior, but does it last? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Mm. A learning effect, a performance effect is, a, is a, a long-term recognizable change in that behavior. And I think when we're talking about that, I say to guys all the time, you know, I almost have to stop myself, you know, enjoying the, the compliments in one sense. And I'll explain that what I mean. You know, you'll do a session with someone and they say, geez, that was a great session. I really enjoyed that. I said, oh, that's great. But you know what? We don't know that it work until you actually have to do that in competition. So let's hold off on any of the compliments and the backslapping of each other now. Because unless, <laughs> unless, this, unless this results in a better performance by you in the competitive space, well then, this was nothing. Mm. And that's not going to happen the first performance out, the first mm. competition out. But let's get used to the idea of, okay, I've got to try and replicate that feeling of uncomfortableness, challenge, and exploration in my practice, but not be looking for, at the end of every practice, that's worked, that's doing this, that's doing that, because we're changing the behavior here. Mm -hmm. The trans-theoretical model of change will tell you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it takes a long time to change a behavior. Mm -hmm. Some people don't are pre-contemplative. They don't even think they need to change anything in the first place. Mm -hmm let alone when they actually get to that point of action, they then got to get to the point of maintenance. How do we how do we keep this going? How do we make this a part of who I am, my my new my 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 new behavior? And I think that's that's a critical point you just said there. It's 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 about making people more robust to the bumps in the road. Mm. If they think it's going to be this lovely, smooth thing and I'm going to practice this tonight and Ed's going to come in and my conversions are going to be great. My kicks from inside the 22 or outside the 22 are going to be great. And then you go out the next day, two days later to the match, and you miss two. Ah, uh, your man is crap. Mm-hmm. No, no. Your, fall, your failure was thinking that that session was the end. That's just a part of the process of building more robust mechanisms and strategies and processes to be able to cope with whatever is thrown at you. Well, the great thing is, the great thing is for that particular coach is actually, I think there's going to be some really, I haven't had a chance to feed back to him yet, but I think there's going to be some really rich learning from him (laughs) because um, his session was a good session. He got it just right. You know, (laughs) it was just right. There was enough challenge point where they were failing. Why were they failing? Because they had to attend to something else. They weren't attending to uh, some of their basic technical things. They were trying to do something quite tactical and they weren't attending to the basics. But that's fine because they're bound to do that because the attention's elsewhere. Yes. Um, Yes. And he got, you know, and he had them at the right challenge point and kind of they were pretty absorbed by it. I mean, I think probably could have dialed up the pressure a bit, maybe, or he could have dialed it down or whatever. But anyway, they just got got the challenge point just about right. Yes. I think it was partly because of I was there, so he kind of wanted it all to flow. Yeah, to make yeah, it work. yeah. And yeah. what's great, I think the great learning moment's going to be, is that actually it was the messiness that was the great thing. The messiness yeah. was the value. And actually yes. not to be afraid of the messiness and actually to really <laughs> embrace that. And actually sometimes, sometimes, yeah, you, it probably could have made a few minor tweaks. Probably yes. could have done that. But, you know. You just, you just hit on a point there that has really struck a chord with me because I'm asked to go in and watch sessions and consult with people, right, quite a bit. And... And I always go in and say, hey, look, I'm just like you. So, do you know, so I started changing because, again, a bit like that, you kind of think, I hope they don't think they need to have the perfect session because I'm standing here. Right? Mm-hmm. My, my last session was a ball of whatever, you know. Yeah. So what I now say to them is I said, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to watch the session. I'm really looking forward to it and, and the best of luck and whatever. But at the end, I want you to tell me the three places in the session it just went apart. So it immediately that changes how they're thinking. I now have to look for the places you're not going to work. So they already think, well, actually, Ed knows this, this isn't going to go the way, you know what I mean? Oh. So rather than saying, at the end, we want to go through, I want you to tell me all where it went well and all that. What if it doesn't go well? You know, they're, they're, all, they're, they're always going to remember the places that it goes well. Mm. But, I, you know, but I also want them to realize, I'm just here to help. You've asked me to come in and have a look. 
It's a privilege to, to, to be asked to do that. But also be aware in the session of, oh, that's not working here now. We'll have a chat about that later on. And, there's, and that's okay to have a chat about where it didn't work later on, rather than, oh, God, it's not working. Oh, my God. And your man's looking at me. Oh, my God. I, I, and I look up at the stand, and he's writing down something. Oh, my God. What has he seen? You know that kind of way? As opposed to when you're in the session, try and keep an eye and, and remember the three, three areas that, that, it, that it actually didn't work for you. Hmm. It, it changed the dynamic then between the coach and me, the, the, the coach advisor, the coach supervisor, the coach consultant, the, or the mate, whatever you want to call it, like, you know? Yeah, I, I, said, I said to him before we started, I said, you know, I'm, I'm just another coach. Yeah. And, you know, I've been doing this stuff uh, for a while, and I'm just another pair of eyes. And I might see some things that you might not be able to see yourself, and I'm here just to help you reflect on those. That's beautiful. Yeah. But, but it's interesting. I, I, you know, it's, I think we're hardwired, though. And I, I've got to admit, I'm, I get that sometimes. You know, you're kind of hardwired. You, you kind of want it to work. And um, you just have to fight <laughs> yeah. with yourself sometimes, don't you? <laughs> you do. And, oh, man, I was uh, I was that kind of that nerd, you know. Mm-hmm. My, the order in my sessions was, oh, it was, it was like... It was like I put Smarties and Skittles out on the mm. uh, on the pitch. They were so big, they were color coordinated, and the this and the that. And, but it just it, I started realizing, and one of the one of the things I started doing actually about I suppose about maybe five years ago now, I started actually you know you have all this load monitoring that we see nowadays and measuring their RPE and measuring all that. that's great from a sports science, from a physiology and the physical preparation to make sure that we've we've got the right we've got the right load for them. Great, absolutely. I started measuring and trying to guesstimate the amount of decisions, the decision load of a session. And it took my coaching into a, a, just a crazy space. I'm a little bit more comfortable now, five years on, but only a little bit more. But it's a, what a difference if you're actually stepping back and saying, OK, that's a decision. That's another one. That's another, and it could get to three, four hundred, but also could be like four. <laughs> And if you're in a session, you're thinking, there's not many de- much decision-making here. Or, wow, look at all the decisions that I'm seeing that they should be interacting with here. Okay, we're in a good space. So I actually started, I started trying to, in one sense, you know, not in a very formal way, but trying to quantify the amount of decisions that were right there and then in the space. Were they, you know, did, did someone just, is, is someone recognizing the space there? Is someone recognizing the gap there? Is someone recognizing, you know, that kind of way? That's another decision. That's another decision. They're having to make a decision right there. Good. They're, or, and when I started doing it, I started actually picking up ways of seeing they're disengaged. Mm. And that was the big thing that came out of that change in my approach for uh, about four or five, five years ago, I'd say, when all of a sudden, when I started counting and checking for their decisions, it, it first of all helped me to step back and let them do it. So it forced me to shut up, basically, because I was <laughs> dual task, couldn't do it. I couldn't be counting and talking at the same time. But it also made me realize, hang on, he's disengaged. In fact, that whole, that three there are disengaged. They're not actually making any decision right now. And it, it changed my interaction with the constraints, the ecological dynamics, and it was a major moment of I now I have a real appreciation of that nonlinear pedagogy and, and all of how they interact, all of those ecological, ecological dynamics, nonlinear pedagogy, constraints, you can call it whatever you like, you know. Mm. But it was like, ha, if someone's disengaged, why? Because in a game, on game day, there's no way they're disengaged. It's very hard to have 11 11 v 11 on game day in soccer, 15 in hurling football or rugby, five in basketball, whatever the sport, and for someone to be switched off. They're just maybe looking at the wrong place or whatever. But I was actually starting to identify, they're switched off because the constraint I have in here isn't working. The task that I put here isn't effective, it's not relevant, and there's shit all context behind it. Yeah. So that forced me to really engage with better environmental constraints, better context constraints. And then that's where that's where all that stuff around where I'm right now with the consequence came out of that about four or five years ago. It's it's interesting that as well. And, and we're now getting into sort of the, you know, some of the, the detail of this. And obviously we're now we're now in the world that I love to uh, love to inhabit around 
because the thing about I think about ecological dynamics and and you know the constraints approach whatever for me is is that there's just so much to learn it's so rich <laughs> every yeah. session is just just there's information coming at me I actually my biggest challenge actually is attending to the information filtering because there's so much and I think that's I partly one of the problems a lot of people struggle with with this is that because there is so many uh, in cues coming to you as a coach and so many potential variables that you might have to attend to, particularly in the dynamic game, yeah. um, that it's sometimes very difficult to sort of filter that out and kind of zone in, and which which is why the likes of Rick, you know, as a practitioner, you know, his skill, in my opinion, is his ability to kind of just go, yeah, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that, it's not, it's just that. Yes. And, and, that, yes. and just zoning in, and it's almost like it's like a laser focus on the thing that needs to be done, which obviously only comes yeah. with experience. But one of the, one of the things that around, around Rick on that, and and I I completely agree with that. The brilliance of what Rick does is that when he shows it, he makes it accessible then to others. Yeah. And that's not easy, man. I've 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 failed in that myself. I I think I'm getting a little closer to being able to describe that space, the dynamical systems, and all of that. But it's it's still a major working process. I've seen Rick do things that immediately get people thinking, huh, so that's what that is. That's really hard. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes that freaks people out. That freaks coaches out when then they try it and they can't. And I suppose that's why things like this and catch this are important for them to realize it is hard. Mm. Don't beat yourself up about this. This is tricky. Mm-hmm. It's really tricky to 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 create a dynamic environment where people have to be very much engaged in a task that is relevant to overall performance and also is really like the actual game. Yeah. And that we're all going to learn in our own individual way because of how we perceive this situation. That's that's not easy. And I think that's where sometimes the translation of the research has failed to get out to the general population. Mm. Because sometimes and I'm I'm guilty of it when we write academically, we get so far up our own backsides about it. We, it's like, I want to write here to make everyone realize how intelligent I am. And you're like, hang on a second. Are you not trying to write for coaches? Yeah. Because coaches don't speak like that. So why do you speak like that? And we need to be better. We need to be better at, fine, if you may need to write something for an academic purpose, for a journal, great. But you, then you've got to... You've got to create some space where they can access it to and make it accessible and make sense of it so they don't have to go through all the SPS and the statistics that you were to do. Mm. Give them the stuff that matters and the, the action points. And, and that's where um, Tim Buzzer down in Australia, he's doing some really nice work in his skill acquisition yeah. uh, pot, uh, blog yeah. where he takes papers reads them in detail and comes away with the salient points for the coaches. Yeah, yeah. That's I, an important place for people because podcasts aren't for everything. Blogs aren't for everyone. Vlogs aren't for everyone. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a really nice space that he's after identifying. And actually, he's doing really good work there on it, let's say. You yeah. Know? I, do you know, I think what he does is fantastic. And I think, um, I, I, you know, I think he's doing a great um, kind of a great service to coaching by, by being able to make that accessible. I mean, it's kind of why I set this up in the back in the day, you know, when yeah. blogging, blogging was, was a, just a thing. Initially, it was about reflection, but it yeah. was partially about um, you know, I was sort of, you know, starting to delve into the literature. This was before we had social media and so much was available to us, you know, in, in, your, in, in the palm of your hand. So, you know, I was digging into research papers and I was, I was interested in games based approaches, TGFU and designer games and all these sorts of things. And I wanted to find out more. So I'm digging into it and then I'm trying it out and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I need to record this somehow. Uh, I need to record my experiences and my reflections because then two things. One is it's a record of my development, which might help me with my development as we move forward. Yes. I was ambitious then, you know, and I wanted to get up, climb the ladder. But at the same time, it was also I thought, you know, well, and also this might help some people because I've been through a real 10 year kind of wilderness years here. And this yes. might be better for some other people, yes. which is one of the reasons it feels so galling to me when I there are uh, certain members of the academic community who have been fairly critical of us bloggers and podcasters <laughs> for essentially probably dumbing down or oversimplifying or, or yeah. perhaps misrepresenting pieces of research, which is an accusation that I'm perfectly prepared to take on board because I've yeah. definitely got that wrong. But yeah. in my efforts to try and kind of share some 
experiences related to items of research or potentially just, you know, ask questions about basis of research. If I get a couple of them wrong, I think that's fair. It's a price to pay. Yeah, pay. yeah, yeah, I agree. And that's that's what's so good about the work of, let's say, Keith Davids. Mm. Here's a guy who could who could with his knowledge and his 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 insights, he could absolutely write the the lore of skill acquisition and have only one or two people who really get it. Yeah. But he doesn't. He writes it in a way that's accessible. He writes it across many platforms. Mm. He's accessible himself. Mm. So then all of a sudden, things that can be quite complex are made simple, yeah. are made are made in a way and are, and are discussed in a way. And he, he says himself, he's only a theoretician and I'm only writing. He's not. He's so much more than that. He gets it. He gets that balance. And the work he does with his colleagues down in Portugal and Travassos and all those mm. guys, mm. They're having a real impact because now they're they're taking something that is quite hard to pin down. They're putting it into good academic through ac good academic and scientific rigor, and then they're actually translating that information back out to where it's going to be accessible to coaches. Mm. That's that's a tricky thing to do. That's a I, tricky thing to do. I couldn't agree with you more. And. I think one of the great things about Keith, um, I think I've only met him once, um, like face to face. We've obviously had some various interactions in the past. Is uh, he's one of? And actually, interestingly, it seems to be characteristic of quite a lot of the people who are exploring this world. Is they're almost egoless. Mm, oh, stop! Man. You just hit on. You just hit on a major point of discussion that I've been having a lot, re a lot of recently. Even this week, in a few, a few different meetings. The translation of pertinent information to a coach sometimes, and I use some of the the terms that Rick uses. You know, you've got to cut a guy, mm. you got to let him bleed, and then yeah. we repair. Yeah. But unless you're prepared to be cut in the first place, unless you let that ego and leave it at the door and be like, "Okay, tell me what you saw." Yeah. You know. Well, then the 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 the, the progression is not there. And then you hit the nail in the head. Keith Davids, he doesn't in any way, shape or form make it feel like that I'm better than you. I have more knowledge than you. He makes it feel like, no, oh, I'm just like you. I've just, just kind of gone down a rabbit hole here. And this is what I found. But here, what do you think of it? Because as you said, the ego just, there's, it's not there. But I think if you see... And I think it's probably something that's consistent and it's it's a it's a nice place to that we've gone here. The the vast majority of coaches who are truly engaged in figuring this stuff out, the constraints led approach, because they have been burned trying to figure it out, it has helped them remove the ego and take the ego out of it. Yeah. So that's maybe something that we need to look at to help you know, again, to normalize it. But I'd say the vast majority of coaches who are very good and who are very uh, astute at working in a constraints-based way or TGF, you or call it what you, what you will. And I know there's subtle differences between all of them, but, you know, the, the yeah. game sense and the, that space of manipulating the environment, you, if ever do you come across someone that has an ego in there because they've been cut, <laughs> they've bled, yeah, they've had to repair. Peter, yeah. Peter Arnott is the guy. Yeah, you know, as you were saying, chatting to him earlier on, uh, this he has some absolute nuggets. But he'll tell you he found that because he was in a space of failure and figuring it out. Mm. And there's another guy, no ego about him. He'll talk and he'll chat through stuff, and and that's that's something that maybe. Maybe it's I don't know, but maybe it's synonymous with this, that if you if you're if you are trying to protect yourself in the coaching space, well, then you shouldn't go anywhere near the constraints led approach. Mm. Yeah. And maybe that's something like a caveat that should be there. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're prepared to 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 get a get a couple of knocks and, and, and be exposed in that space where people are looking at you thinking that was absolutely dire. What are you doing? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but I'll reflect on it later. Mm -hmm. Next week it'll be better. Mm -hmm. Then, then the constraints that approach is for you. It is. It's a space where your coaching and your interaction with your athletes and your athlete experience is has no ceiling. In fact, there's absolute. There's no ceiling for their for for what they can experience. I think um, 
for me i think you're right i mean and, and I, i'm just reflecting actually as we were talking there on my one of uh, an experience where i was cut yeah. um <laughs> But I was nice, sure it's not. I, the first cut is always the deepest. Oh, it was like a song a, about that. It was like a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it took me a long time to recover. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily go quite that far with some people. But, but um, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty brutal experience. But I have to say, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily wish it on others, but it yeah. was transformative. Transformative. When I, when I mended, I really mended an awful lot better, bigger, stronger, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I and look, I'll be I'll be straight with you. I'll go, take it even a little bit more personal. The constraints led approach has had an impact on me as a parent. Mm, for sure, absolutely. I like, I I I I look at my my two boys and I, I'm so delighted. I have the constraints led approach mm. to parenting in my life because I think if I if I didn't, and I was parenting the way I, the, if I parented the way I coached initially, oh my God, what a miserable house that would be, you yeah. know? Yeah. But now we just have a couple of clear rules. Don't throw anything that, you know, is expensive, but anything else, throw it, throw it hard, you know? <laughs> Don't kick anything that we may need as a family, but if not, kick it, kick it hard, you know? <laughs> you just explore because they go to school great school but it's order you know yeah, yeah line up lunch is here boom you can't do this boom we've got golden time for this we've got da, 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 da. they go then to some sport or activity it's order don't talk quiet that they, they got to come home and let go they've got to come home and wreck stuff you know otherwise they will find refuge in the screen uh, yeah but also the other, the great thing is what we're starting to do with them now is hilarious. We, we, we have games at home, like everyone, mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out ways that that game can be played a different way. Yeah. So now the latest one was Jenga. Jenga, build up the blocks, take out the, the block very mm -hmm. carefully so it doesn't knock over. They've started using Jenga to build mazes. <laughs> so they're not actually building them up tall. They're not actually building. You have to try and get your maze through with a marble through. Great. And the floor is an absolute nightmare and you'll stand on a Jenga piece and you'll scream to the high heavens because it's so painful to stand on the Jenga piece. But that's that's what it should be like. Yeah. Our house, and we have a friend of ours who came over to our house not so long ago, like, your house is a bit like, <laughs> a, bit like a nursery. And if it's a compliment, yeah. <laughs> because we've got two small boys, it should be like a nursery. Yeah. It should be, it should be a house that looks like two small boys live in it. Yeah. Not Two small boys are contained in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. it is, and it, and it's treacherous. You stand on a Lego sword some morning at seven in the morning. You know all about it. That's that requ that'll require stitches if you don't get to it. You know. <laughs> I love the joke that they say. You know, women who complain about the pain of pregnancy have never stood on a Lego sword. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's true. But, that, but can you see that space? That that difference. I, I know I know I could go back in my mind and think how would I have parented that fifteen years ago? Mm. Yeah, rules and order. Or yes, rules and order. Rules and order. Rules and order. Now I've got a, a, a fantastic uh, partner in crime to be able to manage these two <laughs> loose cannons in the house. Yeah, but it is. It is. It's about letting them. So there's like there's some of the craziest things go on in the house. But as a result of that, they come up with even crazier things. They're, nothing's a problem. So, case in point, last year I finished up uh, some uh, some kind of project, and I was like, you know, whatever, thinking around things to do. And I said, I'd love to learn how to, you know, solve a Rubik's cube. Never done it. Always thought that must be for people who think in a particular way. You know, very quickly I realized actually no, there's actually, you know an order to it. And then all of a sudden I realized, actually, there's not. There are hundreds of ways to solve the Rubik's Cube, not just mm. one way. Mm. So all of a sudden I started exploring with it. And as I'm doing it, my then eight-year-old, now nine-year-old, was looking at me. And he was like, what are you doing? I said, whatever. We now have four Rubik's Cubes in the house. My nine-year-old is quicker at solving it than I am. <laughs> but we can solve it. Why? Because... Let's just try and figure something out. Now, it, it was a little disheartening the day we raced and he fixed it before I did. <laughs> and even as he's fixed it, no, 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 dad, that won't work. And I'm like, no, it will work. No, dad, you, you have to, as he's doing, he's not even looking at his own cube. 
He's looking at me, telling me that I'm wrong. <laughs> That'll chip away at your ego. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. yeah that is. But it's that space of, and as a result of that, he, he, it changed his way of thinking around maths. Because now he thinks, well, if I can solve a Rubik's Cube, I can solve anything. Mm. And that takes me into that space around donor sports, you know? Mm. That idea of donor sports. What are the sports that you can do that can feed into the sport that you want to do, let's say, especially at a young age? And there's, there's a kind of an idea that I've been germinating around in my head at the moment of, of is, there a, is there a framework to help that? Are there, you know, we've, we've, we've parents who we talk to us a lot about, oh, my kids, they, they go from uh, football to hurling to soccer to basketball. And you're like, yeah, that's great. Well done. But they are all speed, they're all team sports. Yeah, they're yeah. all invasion sports. Yeah. So do you know what? I might actually suggest, why don't you pick, replace one of them with a racket sport? Because they're going to get something. And it's also an individual sport. Yeah. Court sport. Why then don't you also replace one of them or add in a movement sport? Karate, judo, ballet, dance, gymnastics. Then all of a sudden we're starting to get proper donor sports. We're not just saying that all sports are good. Because there's probably a lot of similarity in certain processing that's happening. If you're doing hurling, football, soccer, basketball, rugby, they're all similar things. Take them out of that. Is the, are, are your kids in problem-solving spaces? Are they doing kiddies Sudoku and chess and checkers and, you know, because that's, that's a nice other side of how their brain works. And so to almost expand on that idea of donor sports, and that's a great book that, that David's and Wormhout and Salzburg have just published. Uh, but to actually expand on that, let's, let's give parents an a la carte menu about, okay, I want them to be good decision makers. And all this is fun when they're kids, but not just be blindly thinking, oh, they're doing loads. But are they doing loads of the same thing? So why can't we help parents make better decisions about, well, swimming and you know, a non-weight bearing sport, swimming or, or cycling or a number of non-weight bearing sports and then a number of weight bearing sports and then a number of throwing sports, are, you know, because we all we hear at the moment is that they're doing loads, six yeah. sports. Yeah. But they might be all very similar. Whereas if we can actually say, hang on, let's take this donor sport idea and expand it into a conceptual idea about a rounded individual, a yeah, person who. You know, it's funny, actually, because uh, it's one of the things that I find um, get a bit frustrated when I, I hear about academies that have mm. got, um, you know, particularly in in um, in football where, you know, quite young, you know, eight, nine, they're now doing four sessions a week. And, you you know, so the accusation is made around um, specialization, early specialization, because, you know, there's not much room for anything else if you're doing four sessions a week. And they go, oh, I don't know multi-sport environment we do lots of other sports as well oh what do you do <laughs> yeah we do basketball we do rugby yeah we do oh so you do invasion sports basically do you yes. oh, okay i get it it's not really multi-sport is it um yeah. and like like you say it's 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 not just necessarily from a donor perspective in terms of it's not just about for me necessarily some of the skill components that might that might they might be donating mm. i think it's the the dynamics of it the, the alternate yeah. the alternate dynamics which can be brought to like my, my son particularly likes anything that involves an implement and striking so he kind of likes striking games Brilliant. and and um but then he kind of got picked for the school team at rugby and i'm like <laughs> and they're like well you've never played rugby he goes yeah i know but they think i'm quite good at it i'm like okay great right. let's go and play it's brilliant i said do you want to go to rugby by the way he says no i'm all right i'll, I'll carry on doing hockey but I, I i you know i know it's quite something i can do yeah and he does a lot of basketball um, we play in the, but not seriously, just, you know, playing on the driveway. Tell yeah. you what's interesting about basketball. Never showing him how to dribble, but he can. Yes. With both hands. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Just play 1v1 in the driveway, you know? Yeah. It's so, there's so many things that, again, given the time and space, we'll figure out. Yeah. But we're just, we rush, we rush to answers. And that's, and you, you hit the nail on the head there. It is that space of, oh, I'm able to do this now. Oh, great. How, do, how did that happen? I don't know. Mm. Because you know what? Nobody knows. Yeah. That's what Marcus Sullivan is so strong on, you know? Mm. He calls it as it is. Stop with this nonsense about, you know, this is, you know, professional underage structures. Good God. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know? Streaming kids when they're still 
haven't even hit puberty, under 12s, like, <laughs> putting them into the good group, the poor group, and then the really poor group, you know? <laughs> and they're going to get, they're, the, the good group are going to get the best coaches. Yeah. And then just your annual mom and dad who rocks up on their scooter, we'll give them to the, it's just, sends such a poor message, but also the kids know. Yeah. The kids know. Yeah. As opposed to saying, you know what? We're here to play. Mm. But we keep, and it's going back to some of the, the video content that Rick has put up over the over the years. It's still coming back to that essence, those backyard games. We still find it so hard to to accept that they were critical in our development. Speaking with Mark earlier today, he was going on about Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Sweden didn't produce him. He was rejected at clubs. He didn't make the Malmo under 18 team and all this. But he played street games all the way up. No system, no academy. He's the greatest player ever. Mm. Same with same with um, uh, Henrik... Larson. 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 He was saying, he said, Larson's trajectory is nuts. No system, no structure, no academy. And it's his classic line, as we were talking about earlier on. You know, you no one sees the dead bodies. You fill a bag of eggs, throw it at the wall, one egg survives, oh, our system works. <laughs> Zlatan, interestingly as well, did Taekwondo. Yeah. 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 And it's, and, but you can see that. Rude Van Nisselrooy, black belt in karate. Yeah. So... You look back and you're thinking, ah, pretty good mover. How is that? Well, maybe. We don't know for sure, but maybe. Mm. Because you know what? You look at Zlatan, you look at, you look at Van Nistel and others like them. They really, they really get, uh, you know, when they get knocked over, they really fall badly. Mm. Mm. Because they've learned how to fall elsewhere. Mm. They know how to fall and roll through it. They know how to fall and actually protect themselves as they're falling. And you know? and and, re- and resist the force of somebody yes. else's bodily pressure. Of course. Because yeah. it's that interaction. Yeah. If I'm going to get hit with a punch or a kick in martial arts and I stand there, it's going to hurt. If yeah. I move away at the same time as ha- coming at me, it's going to hurt less. If I can get out of the way altogether, it's not going to hurt at all. Have you have you read a book called um, The Art of Learning by Josh Waitskin? No. No. Right. Got to so write that one down. It was a really interesting, really interesting book. It might be an audio book, but um, right. he is a uh, a chess genius. Right. Uh, the, there's a film called I think it's called um, something moves. Basically, it's, it's sort of similar to um, Bobby Fischer's life, kind of, right. but slightly right. different. So he was one of these kids who played chess in the park against you know in New York against the yeah. the guys, and he he basically learned to play chess by not by learning the kind of the moves and everything else. Mm-hmm. He would be playing these kind of what you might call like almost like scrappy scrimmages against yes. these wily old chess players in the park. Yeah. And more often than not, the way he would, um, you know, kind of win. And in fact, this became a, a feature of his uh, uh, approach to chess was he would deliberately create chaos. And he would deliberately create scenarios that he knew the opponent probably hasn't seen before. You know, it wasn't part of a formulaic approach. It wasn't yes. this, that, and the other. He didn't do the, the certain move. His other stuff that looked really strange, and from the chaos, he would find a way to win the chess match. Yeah. And that, so that's how he learned chess, sort of in that very non-traditional, kind of very much like a gamey, scrimmagey kind of a way. And he obviously then refined it a little bit later on. Anyway, he then, he then just gave it up. So he's a child chess prodigy, right? Gave right. it up, just said, nah, not for me anymore, and became a world champion uh, in a particular discipline of Tai Chi called Tai Chi Chuan or something like that. I could right. probably butcher yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also known as push hands. Right. So it's, it's almost like a form of Tai Chi and wrestling at the same time. I've never actually seen it, but and what he does is in this book he goes into excruciating detail of how he is in tu- sort of totally perceptually in tune with the movements of the opponent in order to be able to either resist or 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 give or whatever. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. It's almost like a fascinating expose and everything oh. about ecological dynamics. Wow, uh, that's that's on my list. I've just written it down <laughs> there, and I think you just hit on a point there around how kids learn. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I've speak with parents a lot about. We're in a space in the world right now where parents have misinterpreted research 
so poor, so poorly. Now, again, it's not their fault because it's how the research in itself has then been misinterpreted by journalists and when they write about it and so on and so forth. So we now live in a world where parents think that they're doing their fav- their kids a favour by having them in piano lessons and violin lessons and ballet lessons. And yeah, we yeah. fill their day, we fill their weekend. They're going to get they're going to get all the opportunities I never had. Yeah, we're still not seeing ballerinas coming out of it or mm-hmm. concert pianists coming out of it any more than they ever were before. Mm-hmm. Why? Because these kids are there for all the wrong reasons. There's no relevance for the kids. They don't want to be there. Mm-hmm. They then they then create a social network in the space. So that's they go then because they see their friends there. But for when they're actually there practicing, we're not producing any more <laughs> of these experts than the previous generations who didn't learn through this way, who weren't forced to do it. They all kind of came to that their, their space through exploration, through, I love that. I love that sound. I love this. Whereas we're in the space now where parents are like, you're going to do piano and you're going to get to level eight and then, we're going to, then you're also going to do violin and then, and then you're going to do this and you're going to go to maths camp and you're going to go to science camp and you're going to, as if this is, this is how we grew up. No, we didn't. Not at all. But they think, they've misinterpreted the idea about uh, uh, opportunities, affordances. Yeah. yeah. They've misinterpreted. An affordance is something that almost, is that interaction, you know, that, What's that term? Circular causality. You don't know where it starts. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, am I attracted to you or are you attracted to me? I don't know. <laughs> we don't We don't know wh- which is which. <laughs> but they see these affordances forced. Do this. Well, that's not an affordance anymore. No. Because if you're not attracted to it, well, then it's not an affordance. It's just an There's extension no of school. It's exactly. an extension of school. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where that we lose that space of exploration. We lose that space of just freedom to think figure stuff out ourselves so like my our, our kids we come home you know the oh parent teacher meeting great go to parent teacher meeting great lovely teacher all that great oh he's doing you know his his writing is very good or a little behind on his maths i can imagine what parents must think it like that oh, behind his maths we need to do more math no he's five he's six he's ten he's whatever he's got other things going on in his head at the moment maybe he's just not you know what i mean but yeah. we're so sit- structured around there is an achievement complex. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. And it yeah. takes us away from saying, let him find it himself. Maybe, you know, like, and, and then what happens is we then get into the space where people and kids start thinking, oh, I'm just not that way inclined. Oh, you poor thing. That's not the case. <laughs> You've already written yourself off. Oh, I'm just not that way inclined. That's just not for me. I'm not Nazi. Mm-hmm. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Either you've probably been poorly taught, maybe the environment that you, that you are being taught is toxic, maybe it's not being made fun to you, maybe it's not relevant to you, it's not. And that's where we've got to, we've just got to get better at giving them time and space to explore. They'll find things. And then the thing is, when they actually find something that they really like, oh my God, good luck trying to hold them back. They, they, they could dive down the rabbit hole for you, all on their own then. <laughs> they could, um, you could, you could, you could only ever, uh, say that somebody isn't for example you know mathsy or whatever if you've explored all the possible yeah. methodological options of engaging them with maths absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I'm, like, I, I, I'm a case in point i went to university thinking i wasn't mathsy yeah i've had this out with my mother why my mother hated maths so when i come home oh don't show me i hate maths i'm not math I inherited that. Oh, well, maybe I'm not maths either. So then I, I do a test. I don't do great in the test. Oh, I'm not mathsy. Sure, sure, my mum isn't mathsy. I'm not mathsy. Yeah. And all this, you know, cycle. So then because I'm not great at maths, or I think I'm not great, I don't do as much work at it because when you're young, you think, ah, but I'm, I'm good at English, so I'll do more at English. Oh, you're very good at English. Oh, you have a real, you have a real talent for English. No, I just did more English. I liked it. And then you told me I was good at it, so that I liked it even more, so I did more of it. And it's this self-fulfilling prophecy of craziness. I then go to university, and I'm like, oh, my God, there's maths. And it, maths because I'm going to be doing biomechanics. I'm going to be doing biochemistry. I didn't even do them. I'm in a sports science degree. Ah, and you know what I realized? I had a really good teacher in university. I could do maths. I, I discovered... Um... I walked into sports psychology first to kind of like, yeah. they said, if you can't do maths and statistics, you can't do this course. I walked straight out. 
<laughs> and, I, and I discovered oh, sports wow. ethics and sports philosophy, and I became a social scientist ever since. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine that barrier yeah. to exploration just like that? Unbelievable, isn't it? Edward, and we see um, that everywhere. Edward, look, I could talk all night. Um, <laughs> But in the in the interest of decision rich environments and also me <laughs> making sure I invest a little bit of time with my children who are Stop. just about to go to shower time and shower time always involves a game. And tonight's game is either going to be a pillow fight or a snowball fight with socks. Good. I like it. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rob that one for my for my weekend showers. Quickly, Good. before before we wrap up, though, um, your your where can people find you on online? Um, online, I'm at, at Dr. Skillack, um, on Twitter. Um, and that's probably, that's probably the best place. Um, I'm, I have my, my email is Dr. Skillack at gmail.com. And I'll just, hey, look, I'm, I'm happy for people to throw stuff my way and challenge, you know, if you, if you see something I'm doing or hear something I'm saying, you don't like the, like the, like the cut of my jib, fire away, you know, I, 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 because it's a bit like you said, I've been cut off enough to realize it's a good it's a good interaction and it'll probably serve me well in the long run. Um, even the, though at um, the time I might. <laughs> and the conference that you mentioned earlier on, where can people find out more? Uh, yeah, again, um, we, so Ali Logan, Phil Carney, myself and Alan Dunton, we, we've put together Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland and we've got um, MSA Ireland as a, as a Twitter feed. Um, Alan has been huge for us on, on getting all the social media stuff. He, he's the young buck. He knows all about social media. So he's got us on Instagram and Facebook and all that. Um, and I suppose that's where it is at the moment. We, we, today's two weeks from when we, from, from when we launched it. And yeah, hopefully, uh, we hope to see plenty of people in Cork and CIT again. Our, the department where I'm at here we're, have been fantastic supporting and coming in in partnership with us to get this thing off the ground. And, uh, April 6th and 7th in Cork. And we've got some great speakers, people we've spoken about here in this podcast. We, we've got Keith Davis coming. We've got Marco Sullivan. We've got um, Nick Winkleman from the IRFU. We've got Rick Shuttleworth. We've got Zoe Vimhurst and the, the, the sports vision specialist. And, and one of the things we're really keen to, to have is that we're going to create a space for people to get stuck into the conversation. We're not looking for having 15 speakers and all that. We're going to have a speaker. We're going to have time then to chat. We're going to have a space where we can actually, actually, hang on, let, let's show this. Let's jump into this space and see, can we figure this out? What does that look like? Anyone want to have a try? You're in a safe space here to give it a go. That's what we'd like to have. Because from all our time around the, on the circuit of conferences, we're not hearing enough people with takeaways from those, those events. So if they're not, not coming away with takeaways, or maybe they are, but then it's not impacting their behavior, well, we've got to do better than that. And we're, we're going to try that. And like, like the constraints, we're going to fail a bit, I'm sure, but we're willing to put some skin in the game and try to do something different around that conference event space to, so that we can impact on, on changing coaches' behavior, first of all, but also normalizing this idea about what constraints like a, a, a coaching is about. Well, it's been a long time since I've been over to Cork, so I'm hoping to make a trip. It would um, be great. The old head of Kinsale is on my bucket list. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> let's see if we can get... Now, that'll be some... That'll be some cool if we could get all attendees down to the old head of Kinsale for a round of calls. <laughs> That's like Fort Knox down there. But yeah. let's see. You never know. We never I know. know. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm realistic. But anyway, <laughs> it'll be great to, great to actually see you all in person, not just over well, Skype. And absolutely. listen... Massively appreciative coming on. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Me too. Just thank you. By. Yeah, thank Cheers. you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Sue. Bye. So there you have it. What an amazing conversation. Um, just felt as if we could have gone on for hours and hours and hours. As it was, um, the time just, just absolutely flew by. Um, I'm loving some of that, some of the stuff that, um, I mean, that was rich with brilliant information there from Edward. I'm really appreciative of him coming on. I, I love this idea of um, uh, high fidelity coaching, you know, really aligning it to the competitive experience, making it as close as possible. Um, I really love the idea that the way he's, you know, playing with consequences and dealing with failure. Um, 
and and also you know the, the challenge he puts out there to coaches you know particularly around you know not not just being coached the way that you were coached when you were playing and, and the, the impact that has um yeah once again thank you Ed, for coming on it was fantastic um need to make a shout out to um some amazing people who've um chosen to become a supporter of the podcast um so martin beckford mark peters John Alexander Burns and Rob Chapman, uh, you're all awesome guys, uh, and uh, you're getting a big virtual fist bump from me for for sort of um, backing what we do. Uh, if you do want to uh, become a supporter of the podcast, then um, head over to uh, to the website talentequation.co.uk and you just click on the Patreon button and jump in there wherever you want to. Uh, you can buy me a cup of coffee if you want to, um, or, or you can do something a little bit more. It's entirely up to you. Um, and uh, all of your support would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, once again, uh, best of luck with uh, whatever you've got going on in your coaching journey, uh, your talent development journey, and I'll see you next week.